My neighbor was downsizing his possessions and filled a roll-off dumpster with what he had removed from his house. At the time, I was gathering scrap metals in my garage to recycle at a scrapyard. The neighbor gave me permission to pick out what scrap iron I could find and to add it to my load. Well, one thing I found was an old sewing machine that was worth about $2 as scrap iron. Sewing machines are precision machines and this one was seized, so it was probably junk even if I could get it running. A corner of one of the legs was also broken off and missing. Well, I'm a curious guy, and I never saw a machine like this, so I did a little research. The tag said it was a Singer Model 29-4. A quick internet search showed that there is a demand for this old machine, and they sell for hundreds of dollars if they work. This machine is called a boot stitcher because it was designed to repair leather boots. Well, I always wanted a machine to sew leather, so I gave it a thorough inspection. The serial number revealed that the machine was likely made in the spring of 1908. They stopped making these in 1927, so even if I did decide to rebuild it, parts could be hard or impossible to find. When it was dropped into the dumpster, parts of it were broken, such as the zipper foot, the foot lifter lever, and the rod that holds the thread spool along with a few bolts. The tire on the bobbin winder drive was shot. The drive belt was missing. Many parts are very rusty, like the thread waxing tanks, some moving parts, and the entire treadle assembly. The good news is that the treadle still worked. Well, I downloaded a manual, and it said to put kerosene in the lubricating ports if the machine became sticky, so I added a bunch of it and let it soak overnight. Then I gave it a second treatment, and I tried to turn the hand wheel. It still would only turn a tiny bit, so I kept working it back and forth. After a while, it turned a little bit more, so I kept at it until it was finally free. That took about 30 minutes. It was then that I decided not to scrap it and try to restore this to a usable condition. I didn't want to make it pristine, I just wanted to use it. The legs have a symmetrical pattern, so to repair the broken leg, I first made a pattern by tracing the good part of a leg onto a piece of paper, then matched that to the broken leg. Next, I bent rectangular pieces of steel to the shape of the pattern, and welded them together and to the broken cast leg. Then using the welded shape as a pattern, I bent small square pieces of steel to fit on both sides and welded them. Epoxy filled in the corner so the shape was similar to the original casting. Using a file, I rounded the sharp outside corners and the resulting shape was close to the original casting, but it was still kind of rough. The next step was to de-rust the treadle and all the other detachable small rusty pieces. There are many ways to do this, and I chose to use electrolysis, but I didn't have an electrolysis tank, so I had to build one. This large plastic box was abandoned at our house by the previous owner, and is just big enough to fit half of the larger pieces in. I figured once half of them was de-rusted, I could just flip them over and de-rust the other half. The only problem with this tank is that it leaked because of a large crack in the bottom and bullet holes the size of BBs scattered on its sides. To fix the leaks, I welded the crack using strips of plastic for a filler which were cut from an old flower pot because they were the same type of plastic. Then I reinforced the welded crack by placing a strip of window screen on top of the other weld and using more filler from the flower pot. Some scrap rebar that my wife had welded into a square frame made an excellent sacrificial anode. An old battery charger set to 6 volts provided the electricity. It drew anywhere from 2 to 4 amps depending upon how much metal was in the tank. That's less than 10 cents per day for the electricity, and I left the parts in the tank anywhere from half a day to two days, depending upon how deep the rust was. Well, after de-rusting the leg, I ground and sanded the epoxy and then painted it. The repair is only noticeable if someone looks at it closely. Three of the bolts that hold the sewing machine to the base were broken off, and the fourth one was missing. This one was sticking out and easy to remove. The other two had to be drilled and removed with an easy out. Similarly, the thread spool post was easy to remove. It was then that I discovered that all of this hardware had 1028 threads. Hardware with 1024 and 1032 threads is plentiful, but the only 1028 bolts I could find were too short. So, I bought a 1028 tap and die and made my own. The original thread spool holding rod was missing, so I guessed at the dimensions and made this one. Next, I tried to take apart most of the machine to inspect, clean, and lubricate. Some of the bolts were stuck, but an impact driver loosened them up. There were only two bolts that I couldn't get off, and I left them. 
One was really big and I didn't think it was important enough to build a tool to remove it. The other was a tiny set screw with a screwdriver slot that was mangled and I was unable to loosen it. At this point I tested it by sewing a short line. The machine was adjusted to the shortest stitch length but produced 12 stitches per inch which is too fine. This is typical when the feed motion bell crank lever is worn. When I took the head assembly apart I discovered that the bell crank lever was broken. It's surprising the machine even worked at all. This part's no longer available for the Model 29.4, but it is available for Singer's 29K series. I bought one hoping that it would work, but they're not the same. Two big differences are the web and the thickness of the ring. This is an imprint of the ring made by oiling the 29K part and setting it on a piece of paper. The inside diameters of both parts are the same, but the thickness of the original ring is less on one side than on the new part. So I ground down the new part to closely match the original part. It worked and now I can get six stitches per inch. I also bought a new foot and foot lever for the 29K models. Both were slightly different from the broken parts that I had but were made to work with a little drilling and a little filing. I didn't want to buy new decals which are available for this machine so I masked them cleaned up most of the rest of the machine and painted it with some black spray paint I got from a local store. I also made a new parts drawer because the original one was missing. Now that it was working, I tried to adjust everything to make it sew better. I found out that the upper tension kept changing from too much tension to too little tension. The problem was the thread that I was using. The thread in this spool was meant to be pulled off the top and not the side like I was using it. The force to pull the thread off sideways kept changing and screwing up the upper thread tension. To fix the problem, I mounted the thread spool low and replaced the thread spool rod with a thread guide. After all that, I gave it an extra amount of lubrication and found that the sewing machine was skipping stitches. The shuttle was a little sloppy and slightly worn, so I bought a new one for the 29K. The new shuttle worked fine without any modifications, but it didn't solve the problem. I tried several combinations of needles and threads and finally I found one that worked the machine stopped skipping stitches. I plan on using this for sheets of leather and not for fixing boots so I built a tabletop. There is a notch on the base plate and hooks on the sewing machine that I am guessing were made for this purpose. This table is simply two boards hinged together. The bottom board rests in the notch. There are two pieces of leather screwed into the end of the top of the board and they rest in the hooks on the sewing machine. This allows the table to be quickly removed and reinstalled and it stores flats so that takes up very little room. Another problem is that I couldn't sew a straight line. So I made a guide. The needle plate sticks up higher than the table so I had to make a groove on the bottom of the guide for clearance. Also, the top of the foot and the screw that holds it on prevent the guide from getting too close to the needle so I notched that part of the guide too. That allowed me to get closer to the foot for making narrower seams. Leather is expensive so I found two worn out chairs that somebody was giving away. I took them apart, saved the leather and scrapped the rest. The guide works well, the machine stitches well and I'm finally ready to make a project. I started off making pouches which are quite easy to make. Here I'm making a foraging bag which is slightly more complex. It has plastic mesh for the body because when collecting mushrooms it allows spores and small insects like robe beetles to escape. To reinforce the seams I'm adding strips of leather to the edges of the mesh. This is the bottom edge of the side of the bag. White glue can temporarily hold things together before they are sewn. Paper clips make nice inexpensive clamps and when this project is finished they will be used for chip clips. Next, I cut out a round piece for the bottom of the bag and likewise glue and clamp a strip of leather on it. Then I glue and clamp the bottom to the sides. When the glue dries, I sew the leather strips together, entrapping the mesh in the middle.
After that is completed, I sew the side of the bag closed using leather strips to trap and reinforce the plastic mesh. As you can see here, I have a hard time sewing straight lines in this machine. Later, while making nail pouches, I figured out that clamping a board to the workpiece makes a good guide. Folding a strip of leather over the top of the bag made a good edge. Here the bag is sitting upside down waiting for the glue to dry. Singer made this machine with a long skinny arm. To do so, he had to miniaturize some internal parts like the bobbin. It's going to run on a thread now. An advantage of using the guide is that I can position the needle in one of the old holes and sew the seam without making more holes. You can see some glue oozing out of the seam because I didn't give it enough time to dry. I forgot to record the rest of the construction, so a description will have to do. I made a protective cover to store the bag by sewing on a large piece of leather that covers a folded up bag. On it is a belt loop so it can be worn on a belt or a strap can go through it to be worn like a purse. On the other side is another loop of leather for the tongue of the cover to go through and then the tongue is held in place with magnetic snaps. The bag itself has little belt loops for a drawstring, which is secured by a cord lock. After saving this machine from the landfill, I have become its current caretaker. I hope this inspires others to salvage other bits of history and become caretakers too.